Hello, and welcome to the third part of our content in social psychology, um, research conducted in social psychology. We'll talk right now about experimental designs. So in our last lecture on correlation, I worked with you on factors that you guess might correspond with happiness. We talked in the end about how we could not attribute causal relationships to correlational findings. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what we can do to establish causal relationships. And I'm going to step back and qualify that. What we can do to um, identify models that are likely to explain causality. We can never say we have truth or we found the truth when we're doing a scientific paradigm because we're just finding things that are highly likely to be accurate or to be explanatory, but we would never say absolutely true. And you'll talk more about that when you take statistics. So the question then looking still at this factor of happiness is does giving away money make people happier? What do you think? And as you think about questions that might interest you in this class, maybe this is the kind of question that you would think about. If you just look at it from the start as an idea you're interested in, you might not be able to think of how you could conduct a study on it. So it will help you to watch how this question was answered experimentally. So how could we find out if giving causes happiness? Some of you might be saying, well, we could ask people how much they give and we could ask people how happy they were. And in that case, you would have a correlational relationship if indeed you found that giving away more money related to happiness. So we know that's not going to work because that won't tell us if we cause happiness. So I would put you in groups perhaps and, and tell you again that you have a good measure of happiness, assume that. And then I would ask you, how could we find out if giving causes happiness and ask you to think about that a little bit. And if you want to pause and give this some thought, it would be a good exercise. The only way to determine causality is to conduct an experiment. And just in general terms, an experiment is um, a situation in which we try to control every aspect of the environment so that the only thing could, that it could affect the outcome we're looking at is um, the factor of interest. So if we're looking at whether giving causes happiness, we would try to, cause, to control every single thing and then expose subjects to something to determine if they're happier. So to be a true experiment, two things have to be present. And so you can always just look for these when I start to give you examples in class. You need to have A, a manipulation or treatment. What this means is you have to do something to some of the participants that you didn't do the other. So you have to either manipulate a situation so that some of the participants are exposed to it and others aren't, or you have to give a treatment. This would be like a medicine, give a medicine to some of the participants and not to others. And how do you decide who should get the manipulation or who should get the medicine and who shouldn't? Well, you have to have what we call random assignment. By random, we just mean by chance. So by chance, individuals would be assigned to group A taking the medicine or group B not taking the medicine or taking a fake medicine or placebo. So um, often students get mixed up on what random assignment is and they confuse it with the concept, concept of random selection. When we talk about random selection, we're talking about sampling. In that instance, we're deciding who should participate in our study. We'll, we'll put all of the names of our population in a bowl and we'll randomly select 30 of them to participate in our study. That's random selection. But in random assignment, you are putting all of the names of your participants in a bowl, and these are the participants who have already been selected, and you're pulling one at random and saying you're in group A, and pulling one at random and saying you're in group B. And that's what we mean by random assignment. To understand this content, you need to be familiar with the term variable, which we've already reviewed in our last lecture. You have to be familiar with the term independent variable, or IV, it's commonly identified as, and dependent variable, 
or DV. We'll look at this in some examples, but first I will give you these, this def these definitions. Independent variable is the variable that's controlled by the researcher, the variable that represents the treatment. And it's independent because it's independent on any, it's, there's nothing that it's depending on except that random assignment. So if we were doing a study of a medicine, and I'll show you this example in a moment, um, the independent variable would be the type of medicine the person received, whether it was the real medicine or the fake medicine, placebo. The dependent variable, or DV, is the variable that's being measured that might be expected to change as a result of the treatment. So if we're looking at a medicine, I'll show you this in a moment, the dependent variable would be whether it makes the person healthy or whether whatever we were expecting the medicine to do, whether it did it. So this is the medicine example. Imagine that somebody that we're trying to develop a treatment for shingles. We would start by making sure we had a manipulation. We're gonna give people a medicine or not give them a medicine. That's what we're gonna manipulate. And so su subjects with shingles would be randomly assigned to a condition and then we would measure recovery. And here are these two conditions. Condition one is the medication that has an active ingredient. It looks like this, and half the individuals are randomly assigned to take this medication. Condition two, the control group, is medication with no active ingredient. So there's nothing valuable in here, but they're still taking a pill. Um, and because we, want, we won't go into that bind and study blind, you probably remember from your intro class. And so the two variables we have would be medication type and recovery. The type of medication is one variable, recovery is the second variable. And in this case, we would call the independent variable or the IV would be the medication type, active ingredient versus control. And as you know, this is also our manipulation or treatment. And the dependent variable, DV, would be recovery. And we might explain this another way by saying, in other words, these researchers hypothesize that the variable recovery will depend on the independent variable type of medication. Another example then related to happiness giving is also a nice example for our social psychology class. The the, Dunn, Atkin and Norton were interested in studying this and their manipulation was this. They, they were actually, of course, working at a university and their participants were college students who wanted to participate in this study so they could earn extra credit in their psychology class. So they invited these students to come to an office and they didn't tell them that much at that time about exactly what they were doing, but they just gave each participant $5 and they randomly assigned them to a condition. And I'll describe those in a moment. And then at the end of the day, they told subjects they needed to come back. And then at that time, they, were, they rated the happiness levels of each participant by giving them a scale to measure their happiness. So in essence, they came in in the morning, they were given $5 and given some instructions. And at the end of the day, they came back and rated happiness. So what was the manipulation? What were the conditions? Condition one, they were given the $5 and given this instruction buy a gift for someone else, and then stop back at the end of the day. And they were allowed in this case, even if they wanted to just put the $5 in someone's tip jar, but they, they were needing to give it away, buy something or give this money to someone. In condition two, they were told, buy something for yourself and stop back at the end of the day. So we have a nice direct contest, a comparison between giving to another and giving to yourself. And in condition three, they weren't given any instruction. They were just told stop back at the end of the day. So what are the independent and dependent variables? Well, we first can identify the two variables. They were the spending instructions, give to another, give to self, or, or the control. <coughs> the happiness measure was the other variable. Which of these was the independent variable? It was the spending instructions. Give versus receive versus control. This was the manipulation or treatment. And the dependent variable was happiness. So if, I, if you were in class, I would ask you, put this in a sentence. The researchers thought that happiness, that the 
dependent variable happiness would depend on which spending instruction they were given. And let me see, oh, I, didn't, I didn't put the results in here. They actually had nice support for their hypothesis. The condition of giving to another was significantly greater resulted in significantly greater levels of happiness than giving to oneself or the control condition. So in this case, this initial study supported the hypothesis that giving is better than receiving. And, um, and they took into account and balanced out like differences among the individuals that might, um, like one person was depressed, those balanced out across groups. So it was irrespective of those kinds of individual variations. So these examples I'm going to go through in class. Um, I'll go through them here actually. A researcher studied whether children who ate high sugar breakfast cereals were more likely to behave aggressively during recess than children who ate low sugar breakfast cereals. And in this case, the variables are breakfast cereal type and aggression. And we would say the independent variable is the breakfast cereal type, the dependent variable is aggression. They hypothesize that aggression, level of aggression at recess would depend on what breakfast cereal they ate. And I think that we will go through these examples in class after all. I don't wanna make this lecture too long. Now, we often have something that looks like an experiment that isn't, and we call them quasi-experiments. They seem like experiments, but alas, they're not quite true experiments. Um, so they have all the characteristics of an experiment, except one, and usually what's missing is random assignment. So let's say, some, why do we do these? Sometimes it's necessary. Let's say we're interested in differences between boys and girls. We have a theory, boys tend to play more video games than girls. Um, and so we put boys and girls into a room alone with either a computer or a box of Legos and we see which is chosen. And so in this study, um, if that was the hypothesis, in the end, what would look like our independent variable would be boy or girl. But we actually can't control that, can we? I can't pull you into a room, I can't get a sample of 30 people, 30 children, pull them into a room and say to the first child, I'm going to assign you to be a boy, and the second one, you're gonna be in the girl group. We can't randomly assign. So this is a quasi-experiment, and maybe it's necessary. The only way you can compare boys and girls is by comparing boys and girls. You can't assign that. The second is ethics. The second reason we might have a quasi-experiment is ethics. Maybe someone has a theory that women who smoke during pregnancy give birth to lower birth weight infants. Would it be ethical to bring a number of women who are pregnant into a room and say, I'm going to assign you to smoke a pack a day and assign you to not smoke at all and continue till everyone was assigned. Could I do a true experiment that was ethical? And the answer to that is no, we cannot um, because that would be unethical to tell some woman they had to smoke and it would be um, not even possible because people who don't smoke often can't smoke. So those are a couple of the reasons we see quasi-experiments. Um, when we have our class meeting, I'll be going through and giving you examples and we'll be talking about these more. So natural experiments do not include treatment control and random assignment, but they still explore meaningful data. Like we might have a pre-post study. We might look at happiness just to go back there. This is an example described in your book as happiness level before and after marriage. Well, we're not having a treatment and control group, and we're not randomly assigning anyone to anything, but we're just comparing happiness levels. So maybe before people get married, we take a gauge of their happiness every three days for a month, and then after they've been married for three months, we do the same thing again. And we would be comparing, in this case, their pre-marriage happiness with their post-marriage happiness. Um, so they still have value. Um, it's... Um, and then we can find out if they're happy or not on average, um, but it's not an experiment. We could not say that marriage caused happiness in that case because it's not a true experiment. We might also look at something that's just happening. So um, a lot of people think that recess, running around a bit, helps students concentrate during the school day. And maybe some researchers at their children's school, they were finding that they were, the administrators were going to remove the recess time. 
And so maybe what the researchers would do is to gather concentration data, take a measure of students' concentration before and after recesses are taken away during the school day. Um, so they would be, the recesses are gonna be removed on November 1st. And so they would gather concentration before and concentration after and see if the levels changed. And the reason we can't draw a causal conclusion if concentration is lower is because there might be other factors. In the example that I just gave, if the data points were before recess was taken away, let's say November, and then after it's taken away, that would be the end of December, and that's approaching on the holiday season, and so concentration might be down because of the holiday, not the recess. And that's the kind of problem we run into with these studies, but we can still have um, valuable insights from them that might lead us to an experiment. And again, these are called confounds. Um, they're complications, they're other factors that could explain the result that you've observed. Uh, we could also be wanting to study phenomena that include, that occur in some areas and not others. Your book is describing to you the introduction of TV, which happened gradually. So it might've come to your town before it came to your neighbor's town. And so for that reason, you could compare those with TV and those without TV and you wouldn't have time factors because the time is the same. You'd be comparing them on the same timeline. And so you have an interesting study. You haven't really manipulated anything, but you've taken advantage of something that's happening in a real area. So you might be able to use other natural phenomena. We've recently had a hurricane um, affect many people in the Southeast, and we might be interested in stress levels and so we might take people who live along the ocean in an area that was hit by the hurricane, measure their level of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and compare them with the stress hormones in individuals who live along the water in other areas. So that might be another example of a natural experiment. Um, and we will stop there for now so that you don't have too long of a lecture in one, and I'll record the last segment, um, Challenges in Social Psychology Resource research for you to check back in with.